Good morning again. I think that's a perfect transition into the sermon today because <clears throat> I, I've done this sermon before, usually once a decade. I like to bring this up. I update it a bit each time, but, but the basic idea is, is that once in a while we need to like step back, take an inventory of ourselves and the world around us and see what's going on. We need to get a checkup from the neck up. Zig Ziglar, who I used to love to listen to, he said, uh, he said, we all need a daily checkup from the neck up to avoid stinking thinking, which ultimately leads to hardening of the attitudes. In fact, I like to do things that, that sometimes are, um, that bring me away from the, all the problems of the world, the things that are going on. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm going to see if I can find this for you. I'm, I'm watching my neighbor's chickens while they're out of town, right? And when I go up, they have a big, you know, coop that the chickens are in, and they're, they like the free range, but they're tough to get back in. So when they're gone for the weekend, I don't let the chickens out, but I go there and I make sure that the eggs are collected and the chickens are okay and they're getting water and food. And, and when I went up there this morning and they all gathered up at the front, I wish I had the picture, and they're, they're talking. Have you ever heard chickens talk? They talk to you. I wanted to play you this. This is like one of those things that, that I just get this gratitude for when I think about nature and what goes on. This is the chickens this morning. Let's see. This will work. Because the guy's got to get in on it. Let us out. <laughs> and each of these chickens, they have their own voice. And it was just, it was amazing for me to be there, you know. And, and this is where I thought about this verse. I didn't have the verse in here originally uh, for the sermon. And I put it in this morning after my, my visit to the chickens. It's from Philippians 4.8. We've read this millions of times. Well, that's hyperbolic. We've read it many, many times, I'm sure all of us. But it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Do you believe that? Yes. Do, do, do you believe that if, that if we did this, we really focused on this, that we would have a, a much um, a better mental health about our, our society and about our people? You know, I got to tell you, I'm not going to get into the details on this and what you should or shouldn't do, but I will tell you what, if this is true and we really want to do this, number one, we got to get rid of our televisions, that's for sure, because there's almost nothing on TV anymore. Even the, just the media itself, not the, the medium itself, not what's being, I know we watch 3ABN or Doug Batchelor or whatever, but the medium itself is not conducive to our brains functioning properly or growth of our frontal lobes. And I think that if we really wanted this, we would have to spend a lot more time in nature. I believe that that's true. And that's where we find these things. Even though Satan has worked to corrupt nature, you know, as he does mess up everything else. The fact is, is that, is that once in a while we need to step back and, and we need to reset. We need Amen. to re reboot yep. is what it basically is for ourselves. You know, um, once in a while my phone gets all full of junk and I I turn it off, and when I turn it back on, I come into, a, into the uh, root key, and I go in there, and I flush the cache. And what that means is I get rid of all that junk that's been collecting in there and just get rid of it so I can start it fresh again because that happens to us. I think we slow down. We, uh, we become confused and, and overwhelmed with things, and once in a while we need to step back and we need to take a look at what we're doing and why we're doing the things that we're doing. Me, I'm just going to go sit with the chickens once in a while and just listen to them talk to me because that was a big reboot for me this morning, you know? 
The fact is life is tough. Any disagreements on that? It's hard being a human being anymore. I mean, you can't say anything without offending somebody. You know, you, it's certainly not. I will tell you that one of the things I'm most grateful for, we'll talk about gratitude today, is I am on no social media, nothing. No twi tw tw Twitters or, or um, Facebook or LinkedIn or nothing because I've watched people's lives be destroyed by that. Somebody goes on their Facebook page and expresses an opinion about the way they feel and all of a sudden they're just being attacked and doxxed and swatted and all these terrible things because somebody doesn't agree with their position and people get depressed and discouraged and they, they live in fear because of those kind of things and it's, it's just insane that we're in this place in our society anymore where we can't freely discuss things without fear of retribution. You know, and, and, and life is hard enough without having to engage ourselves in global criticism for everything that we think and we do. Life is tough because we live in a fallen world. I, I, I think I've told you the story before, but this was many years ago uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. There was a, a, a shooting and a, a police officer had gotten shot and killed. And uh, the police chief, you know, showed up at the site because that's, you know, it's a big deal. And uh, the reporter came up to him and he said, you know, what's going on? Why do you think this, this is happening? Why are these things happening? And the police chief, you know, God bless him, looked in the reporter right into the camera and he said, because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes we can't explain why bad things happen to good people except that we live in this fallen world. It's also because we make poor decisions, right? I mean, Susan regularly tells me that everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you make really bad decisions, you know? And, and that happens. And, and one of the things we're going to talk about today, not just about gratitude, we're going to talk about personal accountability, about not playing the blame game, particularly not blaming God when bad things happen, because a lot of times we've brought those things on ourselves. It's not about blaming. It's about just taking responsibility for those things and accepting the way it is so that we can move on with our lives. But that's a tough word, Dan. It's a tough world. No, I'm saying that's a tough word, Dan. Which one? Responsibility. Yes, responsibility. And tougher is accountability. That's right. Because what it does is it draws on us to stop blaming other people. And we need to stop being victims. I heard someone once say, you're not a victim, you're a volunteer. You are where you are primarily because of the choices that you've made. Also, life is tough because somehow we think we can make it on our own. I don't know about you, but I do not possess the skills or the strength to be able to make it on my own. I have to draw upon the strength of the Holy Spirit every single day or I can expect to falter and fall. And, and after a while, that becomes discouraging as well. It's also because there's a spiritual war going on, guys. You know, we're in the middle of this thing. We're... Here, we're, I'm going to read from Job, a chapter from Job. But, but just like he was in the middle of the spiritual battle, so are we. You know, it's not that God's using us as pawns so that he can watch us suffer. I don't believe, at least that's not the God that, that I serve. You know, I believe that we're in a situation where um, things are coming to a close and, and the battle is becoming more fierce for our lives and that we have to be in a position to make a decision uh, either for God or for Satan, because there are no other choices for us to make. 1 Peter 4.12 says, and this is one of my favorite verses, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Don't we do that? Wow, I can't believe all this bad stuff's going on. Are you serious, really? Things that are, that are coming out of, of the government or things that are coming on social media, the fact that people have become more hateful and more vicious and more violent, and we're all surprised, like, wow, I can't believe that's happening. I'm thinking, are you, how is it we can't believe it's happening? Have we not read Daniel or Revelation? Have we not read the end of the book? Do we not know how this thing is going to end? How in the world can we be surprised that things are getting worse? And you know, i got to tell you something. One of the hardest things to do is to praise God that it's getting worse. It's hard because people are suffering and they're hurting. It's hard to be praising God, but he says we should praise God in all things. And why is it in those end things we should praise God? Because it means the end is coming sooner and quicker. You know what? I am willing to give my life for this thing to be over soon. If that's what it takes. 
because I know where I'm going. But if I could shorten the suffering for other people, I'd be willing to do it because I have no fears whatsoever about my salvation is assured. Already done. I'm not afraid of anything. Certainly not afraid of death. Maybe dying, that's not pleasurable. But I'm not afraid of the end result of it because that is a rite of passage for me in order to spend the rest of eternity with God. Miss White writes this. She says, why the Christian life is so difficult to many is because they have a divided heart. They are double-minded, which makes them unstable in all their ways. Amen? So life is tough. Would you agree? Are we tough? Are we tough enough? I mean, are we soldiers in this battle? Well, soldiers need to be in shape, trained, ready to go. I'm not talking about physically, although I think that's an important part of, of our, our character and makeup. But spiritually, uh, we have to be ready. We have to be tough. Uh, this is no place for wimps to be a Christian right now. Because the battle is coming on strong and hard. Satan is attacking as hard as he can. And if we're going to be wimpy about it, we're going to be lost. And not only that, we're not going to be able to help other people. I think we should adopt a saying right now that no Christian left behind. Amen. We should be willing to go out into the battlefield for anyone who's struggling or suffering that's looking for God and to go out and rescue those people and bring them in as best as we can. We don't convert people's hearts. We don't change people. We don't, you know, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Paul says, you know, I plant in Apollos waters, but God brings the increase. But we have to be willing to plant and to water. No Christian left behind. Job 38, 1 through 18. I'm going to read this chapter because this was amazing. You know, you talk about, about whether we're spiritually tough enough. It says, then the Lord, because this is where Job is going through the suffering, and finally what he does, he basically challenges God. Why don't you come down here and let's fight like a man to man. You know, let's, let's have it out. Let's duke it out. Probably not the best thing to say. But he was frustrated, and he challenged God, and God responded to him. He said, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, Job. <laughs> so I'm going to question you, and you better be prepared to give me the answers. That's what God is saying to him. Where were you, he said, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Oh, surely you know. I hear the sarcasm, right? This is the love language right now, sarcasm. He's saying to Job, oh, you, you got the answers for everything? Hey, I'm right here. I'm all ears, Job, is what I hear God saying to him. Who determined its measurements? Oh, surely you know, Job, you know everything. Or who stretched the line upon it? I think talking about the equator. Or, or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? And I picture right now, Job is having, having regret. Duh. He's saying, stop. Can we just stop? You ever do that? You get someone so mad, and then they just unleash. And right when they start unleashing, you're going, okay, wait, wait. In your head, at least, you're going, let's just stop. Stop. I'm sorry I said those things. I wish I could take that back, but we can't take those things back. Job goes on, and God says, or who shut the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud ways be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? And there's Job going, wow. Can't say you don't understand the question, can you? And caused the dawn to know its place? so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked and their uplifted arm is broken. And finally, he says to him, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the, ex comprehended the expanse of the earth? You know, if you never knew what rhetorical meant, this is the definition of a rhetorical question. 
Because does Job have an answer to any of these? No. And God even says to him, well, declare if you know all of this. But he didn't, did he? We are in this position now where, where we need to step back for a minute outside of ourselves and get a perspective on this battle. We should be reading the great controversy and have a thorough understanding of the writings that are in that because it gives a very plain understanding of the battle between good and evil that we're facing in this world for us right now. Each of us need to be prepared in season and out of season to give our testimonies. And the only way that we do that is to improve our relationship with God. You know, when I do a sermon, um, hopefully what I'm doing is I'm speaking to you only from the Word of God. And, and, and I try very hard not to put my own interpretations. I may, I may paraphrase sometimes as to how it sounds in my head, but I'm not going to try and interpret, add to it, or take away from what God is saying. If it's my own opinion, I'll tell you it's my own opinion. Usually I'll phrase it as the world according to Frank. And you're welcome to disagree with me in those cases. But when, when the Bible speaks to us, it speaks of an, of an abject truth. This is not about a, a relativity that what's true for you is, might not be true for me. That's not the case when we talk in the Bible. So I just want to bring that up. If I say things that are not biblically sound, please let me know. I'm happy to, to um, make sure that I don't, I don't make that mistake. All right. So here's Job, by no fault of his own, didn't do anything wrong, right? This is just the nature of what's happening in this battle between good and evil. So what we have to ask ourselves is, are we taking life for granted? Good do you do that? Yes. I do. Do you know that right now as we speak today, there's 783 million people in the world that do not have access to clean water? 783 million, almost a billion people do not have access to clean water. We take that for granted? I mean, you turn on your tap, I'm not saying that's the best water either, but, <laughs> but the fact is, you know, it, it's usually not filled with all kinds of parasites and, and uh, you know, diseases and whatnot. There's about uh, two and a half billion people that don't have adequate sanitation. You know? I mean, th think of the disease that... I remember after the, the earthquake in Haiti. Remember that? Yes. And, and, uh, and the hurricanes that had come through subsequent to that. And they had no sanitation facilities there for people um, at all. Do you know what the global average income is? Global average income. Well, I think average for, medic uh, for Social Security is like 1140 bucks or 1400 bucks a month or something like that. So, so you know what? $18,000 a year, even at the minimum, for people that are on fixed incomes on Medicare. Um, I'm not saying that's a lot. I'm just telling you that's kind of what it is here. Globally, the global income uh, in the world is about $2,500 per year. About 200 bucks a month. That's the average income uh, throughout the world. So if you made $10,000 a year, 800 bucks a month, uh, you'd be in the top 25%. You know, about 13% of the, the entire globe is undernourished. About a quarter of the Earth's population doesn't have electricity. Do you know every month 322 Christians are killed for their faith? 244 churches are destroyed, and 70, 772 forms of violence are, are committed. Uh, by the time we go to bed tonight, 22 United States veterans will have committed suicide. We should try to commit to the names of those people sometimes. Because we do. We take life for granted. Clean water, fresh air, food. Nobody here has missed a day above ground, have they? Freedom to worship. I mean, think about, think about the persecution that goes on in the world right now. Air conditioning. Wait, we had, we had uh, these young girls that were up uh, with a friend of ours, Hillary, visiting us. They come up once in a while and we hang out on the property and do stuff. And one of them, it was very hot out. This was last week <clears throat> when we were up, it was 91 where we live. And uh, 
one of the girls was commenting on how incredibly hot it was. She said, I don't care what anybody thinks. Florida wouldn't even be here without air conditioning. You know? So you wouldn't have been populated. And, and one of, that's kind of true, you know, if you look at population trends, once the air conditioning came about, then there was a significant increase in population in these areas. Refrigerators to keep our food clean. How about a church family? Do we not take that for granted? Again, I never realized how big a deal that was until we started talking to these other um, pastors that don't have churches anymore. They have nowhere to meet and their congregations have just dispersed and some of those people probably are never going to come back. How about your spouse? You take your spouse for granted? We do, don't we? We just expect that, you know, they're always going to be there and always going to take care of us. We ever stop once in a while and, and, and um, you know, get grateful for them because we should be, you know? Do we take God for granted? Well, what do we say? Oh, he's always there. He's always watching over me. He's always taking care of me. I got nothing to worry about, right? Even if I don't pray, if I go into bad places, yeah, you know, God always loves me. He doesn't walk away from me. I walk away from him. And what do we do? We end up separating ourselves in our relationship with Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and they are plans for what? For good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Who is, who is this young, I think it was um, my brother-in-law's grandson. And he was like two or three years old. And he was over, at, we were upstate New York, and he was at the house. And he wanted to go out and play or do something. And I don't know if it, the weather was bad or what it was. We said, no, you can't go right now. You can't do this right now. And at two or three years old, he just looked at us with these sad eyes and he shook his head and he said, I have no hope. You know? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. I have no hope. In those days when you pray, God will what? He will listen. When you, you will find me when you seek me. If you look for me, How? In earnest. With your whole heart. With your whole heart. Yeah. That's what King yeah, with your whole heart. You know, I think sometimes we talk a good talk. I, I, I do, you know. I, I told you, I think, in one of the other sermons, I, I really made a commitment. I want to be a better person. I do. I want to be a better man. I want to be a better child of God, a better husband, a better friend. I really do. I, I, I don't just want to say those things. Because we say those things when we get together with people. Yeah, I want to be a better man. I don't want to just want to be a better man. I want to want to be a better man. I really want to be a better man. You know what I mean? And, and that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen without seeking God in earnest with our whole hearts. So I, I really want to get in better shape. I really do. I really want to, but I'm not willing to do anything. I told you the T-shirt I saw. I was out. I walk a lot. And I was out walking one time on the trail or something, and uh, this person came by with a T-shirt, and it, and it said, um, oh, this was in Tarpon Springs. That's where it was. And it said, um, I want to lose, I'll do anything to lose 10 pounds, uh, except eat less or exercise more. You know? <laughs> so yeah, we may want to be in a way or do something, but, but there's, there's a, an effort that we have to make. There's an accountability and a responsibility in our parts that we have, to, we have to step up to do it. I heard the expression once that faith will move mountains, but you have to bring a shovel. Because we have a part that we have to play. So how do you pray? I mean, do we pray in, in private? Do we pray in our closet? I, I'm not a much for public prayer. I don't do well in that. I feel uncomfortable. That's just the way it is. Maybe I got to get used to it more. Pray with other people. Susan and I pray together. We pray together quite a bit. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get uncomfortable. I don't know if any of you do, you know, in kind of the group prayer thing. Some people thrive in that. But, but it doesn't matter. We have to just pray and pour our hearts out to God. You know, there are people here who have gift, the gift of prayer. I know Delia has the gift of prayer because every time Delia has prayed for me or my wife or our children, God has answered those prayers in the most miraculous ways. Amen. And I'm so grateful that you do that. And I know other people do that. And, they, we, and we pray for each other. You know, up on the screen when we do the prayer time, one of the things that's written up there is you hear people with their prayer requests 
Don't just let that go by. The rest of this week, pick one of those people and pick one of their prayers, you know, and pray for those people. Amen. I'm praying all week for little Mason. That's what I'm going to pray for. Because I know that that's heavy on Mark's heart. You know? I'm going to pray for Natalie and for her sister and, and brother and her father. Because those are things that are important. How do we pray? Do we just, you, you know, oh, what, what was his name? Um, I can't remember. He was with Florida Conference for a long time, and, and he was with uh, the, minister, the missionary work that was done, the ministry. Anyway, he told this story about uh, having dinner at the house one time, and, the, and his grandchildren were there, and his little granddaughter, she was maybe a year or two or something, and she asked if uh, she wanted to have the prayer, and, and she said, yeah, you know, she wanted to pray. And she goes like this to pray, and here's what you hear. Peter Buddha And it's says, what? Peter Buddha Pan. Peter Buddha Pan. Dear Jesus, thanks for our food, amen, right? That's what she was saying, you know? But in her heart, it was this earnest prayer to God, you know, that she had heard. And so we have to take seriously prayer. It's not just something we can do rote, you know? We have to, we have to go into our closets and... You know, in, in, Mo, in, in Genesis 33, 11, it says that when Moses went into the, the tent, you know, the, the tabernacle at that point, um, that he would speak to Jesus face to face as one speaks to a friend. We can pray that way, you know. We can certainly pray that way. Alex Gray is an author. He says it's very easy to take for granted the phenomenon that, uh, that we are each alive, but we must try not to. How many of you made it up, woke up this morning? There's approximately 6,631 people in this country that didn't wake up this morning. That's about how many people die every day in the United States. <clears throat> and, and do we take that for granted? That, that we got up, we saw the sunrise? Well, if you got up early enough, you saw the sunrise. If not, at least you're here in church. Do we take God for granted? and all the blessings that he bestows upon us, because it's only by the grace of God that any of us are here. Do we take salvation for granted? That's a big problem. Romans 10, 5 to 13, it says, For Moses wrote that if a person could be perfectly good and hold out against temptation all his life and never sin once, only then could he be pardoned and saved. But the salvation that comes through faith says, you don't need to search the heavens to find Christ and bring him down to help you. And you don't need to go among the dead to bring Christ back to life again. For salvation that comes from trusting Christ, which is what we preach, is already within easy reach of each of us. In fact, it is as near as our own hearts and our own mouths. What does he mean by that? What does it mean that salvation is as close as our hearts and our mouths? It means that we give our hearts to Jesus and we testify to that faith. For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, what will happen? You will be saved. I mean, there's not more to it than that. I don't have to do a lot more work. There's no sweat equity involved in my salvation. For it is by believing in his heart that a man becomes right with God and with his mouth that he tells others of his faith, confirming his salvation. For the scriptures tell us that no one who believes in Christ will ever be what? I don't know about you, but I could use about a disappointment-free month. How about that? Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord who generally give, generously gives his riches to all who ask him for them. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will what? Our attitudes determine our character. A checkup from the neck up. You have to have an attitude of gratitude. You know, I, I, I wish I would have sent an email out yesterday to everybody and told you to be prepared to come to church today with three things that you're grateful for. Amen. You know? That's going to be your challenge today. Every morning, 
When you get up, I want you to write down three things you're grateful for. Well, maybe at the end of the day, let's do it that way. Write down, and don't write the same thing every time. I'm grateful for Jesus Christ. We know that. I'm talking about things that are happening in your life. When I went to drive up to visit Susan's dad, I think I told you the story. In the first 30 minutes, I almost got rear-ended three times. I'm grateful I didn't get rear-ended. I'm grateful that there was an angel there each time that was protecting me. I'm grateful I didn't give up and turn around and just go home because that's what I was going to do. I thought, if this is the way the trip's starting, and I know that's Satan out there doing everything he can to discourage me from going to spend time with my family up there. Have an attitude of gratitude. We should be able to list a gratitude list all the time, the things that we're grateful for. I am so grateful right now that, that I am up here in, in, in this church uh, to be able to speak to you. Because if you knew me 35 years ago, and I had told you then I was going to be preaching a sermon in a Christian church, you'd have been laughing so hard, you'd have passed out. <laughs> in fact, there are people I know now that I haven't seen in a long time, and when they hear that that's what I do, they're in total disbelief. I am grateful that God's grace fell upon me. I'm grateful that God put people in my life who prayed for me. I'm grateful for my family and that they continue to pray for me and support me on a daily basis. No matter how bad something is, <laughs> it can <laughs> always be worse. All right. Let me warn you right now. Amen. Don't ever say yes. it can't get any worse. Yes. Because it can. No matter how bad something is, it can always get worse. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 4 says... So get rid of your feelings of hatred. Don't just pretend to be good. Be done with dishonesty and jealousy and talking about others behind their backs. Amen. Don't just say you want to be a better person. That's right. Be a better person. Now that you realize how kind the Lord has been to you, put away all evil, deception, envy, and fraud. Long to grow up into the fullness of your salvation. Cry for this as a baby cries for his milk. Come to Christ, who is the living foundation of rock upon which God builds. Though men have spurned him, he is very precious to God, who has chosen him above all others. So I have a suggestion. Let's solve this problem. And to do this, we just have to stop and think. I wrote, I've written several books in my career. The most recent book that I wrote that was published is called uh, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. That's the name of the book. And it's a book on evidence-based thinking. And the whole, the treatise, the whole thesis in the book is this. Just stop. <laughs> Don't do something. Just stop for a minute and, and take an inventory of what's going on around you. A checkup from the neck up means that we just, we stop this kinetic energy for a minute and just look around and take, take hold of what is going on around us. I believe that the overwhelming majority of people in the world have no concept of what's happening around them. They're so focused on what's going on right now in their own lives. You want to solve this problem, there's two ways to do it. One is to take responsibility for your part. The second is to have an attitude of gratitude. Uh, being accountable, taking responsibility, there's a question every one of us should ask whenever something happens. What role did I have to play in that? Quit this blame game. It's never ever somebody else's fault all the time that, that something's going on with you. Granted, sometimes things just happen. That's the way it is. You know, we live in a fallen world. Just deal with it. Quit whining about it. Quit complaining all the time about it. You know, take responsibility for your part of it. You know, I, I know people, they get sick. They're like, oh, God, why is this happening to me? My friend Ed, his mom, um, who was in the, her end of her life was on oxygen and she couldn't breathe and and she had a hard time getting around, you know, and she was at the table one time and she said, oh, Eddie, why is this happening to me? And she's smoking a cigarette <laughs> with oxygen on. And Eddie looked at her and said, Ma, 
You smoked your whole life. What did you think was going to happen? Right, what was it? Taking personal responsibility for our actions. Being accountable for our decisions. So first of all, no more excuses, guys. Excuses are for losers. Secondly, we're not victims. We're volunteers. Almost all the time, these things that happen to us have to do with some decision that we've made in our lives. Even, even Job, because he chose to serve God. Do you know, he could have denied God and walked away and that would have all ended? Yes. Yes. So, so he can't blame God that he chose to be a child of God to stick with him. I mean, that's his responsibility. It's not a fault. It, 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 it's, it's an accountability. No more excuses. We're not victims. Everything happens for a reason, and sometimes the reasons are we just make poor decisions. Genesis 3, 8 to 13. This is the famous story about blaming somebody else for everything else that's happening. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. I love this. Who told you you were naked? <laughs> I mean, I've heard people say, I'm not worthy of God's love. And I'm like, who told you that? Who said that to you? Right? right. I can't be saved because of the things I've done in my past. Who told you that? Satan told you that. Because that's not coming from God. And he said, well, I was naked. And, and, and the Lord says to him, who told you that, you know, that you were naked? Oh, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? No excuses. Don't be blaming somebody else for this. You made a decision, and it was a poor one. The man replied, oh, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Yeah, after, after he had praised God for that woman, for his helpmate, yeah. now he's blaming God <laughs> for what she did. I mean, so this is the world according to Frank. I just picture, I picture Eve when he said that, just backslapping him. Bam! <laughs> you left me. Oh, there's another blame game. Then the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? Hey, it wasn't me. It was the serpent that deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. What did God say to them? What did God say? Don't eat from that tree. So it doesn't matter what anybody else says. That's the Lord speaking to them. And if we choose to listen to somebody else's voice, that's on us, not God. Let us rise up and be thankful, for if we didn't learn a lot today, at least we learned a little. If we didn't learn a little, at least we didn't get sick. <laughs> and if we got sick, at least we didn't die. So let's all be thankful. Isn't that a great quote? Yes. You know who that's from? No. Buddha. I know if I had said that on there, some people would be like, oh, I don't want to hear what Buddha has to say. But it's just a quote. It just makes sense. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 to 18 says, Dear brothers, warn those who are lazy. Comfort those who are frightened. Take tender care of those who are weak. And be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always tries to do good to each other and not to everyone else. Always be. Always keep on. No matter what happens, always be thankful. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. How many of you have heard someone say, I just don't know what God's will is for me? Have you ever heard that? Yes. Tell them to read 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 to 18, because right there it says that this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.12 says, Always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. And finally, Psalm 188.24 says, 
Read this with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Is that so hard? How is it that we complicate all this stuff? I mean, the Bible makes it pretty simple. God's, when, when I am in prayer and God is speaking to me, there's just not a lot of double talk and confusion going on. It's pretty plain and simple. It's not like I got to have, you know, a doctorate in theology to get this. It's just not the way it is. In fact, maybe having a doctorate in theology make it harder to get. Maybe I overthink it too much. Let's stop overthinking this and just look at what the Lord is saying to us. In closing, I'm going to quote this from Miss White. Listen to this. Every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own. An atmosphere, it may be, charged with the life-giving power of faith, courage, and hope, and sweet fragrance of love. Or, it may be heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness or poisonousness, poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin. I am who I am today and I am where I am today because of the sum total of the decisions that I have made. Right. Some good decisions, some bad decisions. Who do I have to blame? Nobody. Me. Certainly not God. My friend Henry P. Shaw would say this all the time. When something bad happened to me, he'd say, I would never go, God, why me? Because I knew why me, because I made bad decisions. When something good would happen to me, I'd say, God, why me? Because it's something that I didn't deserve. By the atmosphere surrounding us, each person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected. It's not just us, guys, by our attitudes. It's not just us by our character and our behavior that becomes impacted. You may be the first person, the first Christian that anyone has ever met, and they will judge all Christians by your behavior. We need to be aware of our surroundings. We need to stop doing and start being. We need to just slow down sometimes. We need to reboot and reset. Take hold of our surroundings. Do an inventory. Figure out what's going on. What tools do we have to work with? You know, we don't have to always be kinetic, moving all the time. Doesn't, don't you just get exhausted by that? How many of you sometimes you plop down into bed at night and you're like, I can't believe, I don't know how I'm going to get up and do this all over again tomorrow. And sometimes we need to slow down before that happens. That's all, that's all I'm saying. And I think the Bible speaks to us that way. Take hold of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And stop focusing all the time on what's going on in the world around us. Amen? Amen. Doris?